My name is Marcus Bueller. I am the McAfee Professor of Engineering at MIT, and my goal is to create bio-inspired sustainability. We want to be able to create almost any function out of almost any material by using nature's hierarchical design approach that reassembles molecules to create functional diversity out of universal building blocks. This is a powerful paradigm that I believe will change the way we construct as engineers, the way we design as engineers, and the way we can actually address the sustainability challenges that we're facing today. The world in 30 years is going to look very different than the world today. We'll have a changing climate and additional constraints on the environment. We have higher population densities, we have less resources likely, and we're going to have more waste. And this waste is going to include more chemical diversity and maybe even nanostructures. We also have different climate conditions. We have changes in temperature and humidity that we'll have to deal with. On the other hand, we have a lot of hope and opportunities ahead of us. We expect major breakthroughs in nanotechnology. Uh, we can assemble materials atom by atom. Uh, we can discern transformations using the existing building blocks in waste or in existing materials to designer materials that are made atom by atom and constructed molecule by molecule with tailored desirable functions. We'll also be able to engineer living organisms, biomaterials, and look to nature for inspiration. We can work with nature instead of against nature and create new solutions for humanity. Biomass, waste, and advanced materials are inextricably linked and provide major opportunities for the future. Biomass, for instance, is a renewable material. It's a carbon sink, and it's easily available today already at 1 billion tons per year in the United States. We can then use these biomass-based materials to create carbon materials, nanomaterials, composites, or even energy materials such as electrodes and batteries. The paradigm we're using is called materiomics, to design materials atom by atom. Just like nature constructs materials with advanced function from virtually any resource, we can use the materiomics approach to build materials molecule by molecule with advanced function. To do this, we look at materials at multiple levels, from the nanoscale all the way to the macro scale. At the nanoscale, we're dealing with chemistry, the assembly of molecules, how molecules form micro and nanostructures and mesoscale structures, which then in turn assemble into hierarchical levels all the way up to the macro level that we can see with our eyes. This multi-scale structuring is really the hallmark by which biological living organisms are constructed and they're exemplary manifestations of biorefineries. Nature is able to refine materials, reconstruct, reorganize materials from virtually any source. We think about spiders, for instance. Spiders are amazing species. They build spider webs in two dimensions and three dimensions. They create very complex material constructions for various purposes, such as protecting their prey, protecting their young, their offspring. And these silk materials are all made from what we call proteins or amino acids. Another kinds of protein materials are those found in the ocean, such as the glues in marine materials like mussels. They create incredible glue materials that work underwater in seawater under virtually any conditions. We also find biological materials made from proteins in the human body, such as in our cells, in our nerve cells, in our skin cells, through organ cells, virtually anywhere. We are made from proteins. Proteins are nature's choice to build materials. And proteins are really constructed from very simple chemical building blocks called amino acids. These amino acids are the same building blocks wherever you look in nature. However, they create an astonishing array of diversity and properties. Out of universality comes diversity. That's the hallmark of nature. Can we mimic these processes and construct superior materials from universal or simple building blocks? This might help us solve the sustainability crisis we're facing today. In fact, nature uses this hierarchical patterning approach to construct materials nano to macro, and we can create multifunctionality even by reassembling nature's building blocks along the way as we need them. That way we can make materials that aren't static anymore. These materials can be adjusted, modified as the need changes. We call this the universality diversity paradigm, which is one of the most foundational aspects of how materials are used in nature and could provide an important clue, an important solution to the climate crisis we're facing. Think about a tree growing from a seed, forming the first leaves. These leaves grow, provide photosynthesis, create biomass. The leaves uh, fall off in the fall, uh, they rot, and they create new soil, and the cycle repeats. These kind of biological mechanisms where creation of structures is repeated, and recycled is foundational in nature. When we look at biomass, like old leaves or wood or many other kinds of tailings that we find in nature, they have a very rich set of chemical foundations within them. These chemical building blocks or molecules can be utilized if we manage to reassemble them to create almost any material function we might need. 
That's what nature does. When you think about a spider, a spider will eat a fly and break down the amino acids, the proteins in the fly's body to reassemble them to make silk, which, one of the, which is one of the strongest materials known. It's an amazing polymer. Silk is not made from petroleum. Silk is made from a renewable resource. Silk is made from biomass, from waste. We cannot yet do that. We cannot yet mimic these processes fully in the laboratory, but provides an amazing opportunity for future engineers, for scientists to create this future economy in which we can recycle or reassess material combinations from the nano, nano to the macro level. The paradigm that nature uses is out of simplicity emerges complexity and structure and superiority of function and form. We use a multi-scale modeling approach to address this issue and to solve this pressing engineering challenge. We simulate materials atom by atom through the scales from molecular dynamics to coarse grain simulations all the way to the continuum level where we simulate materials as a macroscopic object that has no internal structure. By integrating multiple simulation paradigms, we can provide powerful solutions to how materials work and function, and we can design them. For instance, think about a spider web. We can look inside the spider web and see that the spider web has internal structures. There are atoms inside, molecules, proteins inside, and these proteins are assembled in certain architectures. If we understand how these proteins are assembled, we can mimic this. We can make our own protein materials. We don't necessarily have to make a spider web. We can make materials that we need for, for engineering. For instance, filtration devices, batteries, structural materials for construction, and the list goes on. This bottom-up approach is very powerful and can provide a direct connection between the genetic sequence in a material all the way to the functional level. We can either engineer the DNA to design how proteins fold, or we can make materials in the laboratory synthetically and assemble them atom by atom. Thereby, we can take advantage of foundational processes like size effects in materials, where the small scale, the small length scales that can be controlled by these nanotechnological approaches can provide superior function. In other words, materials can become resilient if we make the nanostructures small enough so they can prevent from fracturing and being fragile. That's one paradigm in which nature uses defects. To the contrary, defects are used to create strength. Out of weakness comes strength. And the key to this is architecture all the way down to the nanoscale by creating confinement effects where geometry plays a key role. The hierarchical design paradigm is a very powerful way used by nature to generate function out of weak building blocks. For example, you can look at bone. Bone is made from two components, protein, like jello, which is very wobbly, and chalk, or minerals, which are very fragile and brittle. By combining jello and chalk into a material across hierarchical structuring, bone is created, and bone is one of the toughest materials we know. Similar materials are seashells, like conch shells, which have very, very high toughness values. We're using this approach to design with nature instead of against nature, provide solutions that are sustainable and work with nature. We've utilized this approach in a variety of ways. For instance, we've utilized silk made by silkworms and created cocoons and then re-engineered the materials in these cocoons to 3D print it into various kinds of textiles, into very strong materials, into tunable materials, or even medical devices, or even engines or motors we can use for tunability and functional materials. We've also made filtration devices out of silk. A simple process where we reassemble the microstructures, the nanostructures that nature is creating in the, in the formation of silk fibrils, we can create nanoporosity, mimicking the structure of silk cocoons, but scaling them down all the way down to the nano level so we can filter out molecules. This might be another powerful way to address pollution. Silk inspired materials and devices are very interesting because silk is a biomaterial that's compatible with the human body and other environmental systems. It's not a synthetic polymer. It's something that nature creates. You can eat it and you can work with it and it's inexpensive. So creating filtration devices out of silk or advanced electronics is a powerful way of working with nature instead of against nature. The filtration devices are very effective and can filter out very small molecules such as heavy metals, metal particles, and other kind of organic substances. A second approach we've been exploring in my laboratory is to use waste and rearrange the molecules inside the waste to create future patterns of molecules that resemble those found in nature in other materials to create superior function. Thereby, we can mimic what the spider does. The spider will eat flies, have offspring, create new silk, and these silks are powerful and very effective in creating advanced function. We can mimic this by using a process called hydrothermal processing, or HTP, in which we use pressure and temperature to create new materials. By using high temperature and high pressure, we can use water as a solvent instead of relying on petrochemical or other aggressive chemical substances which are toxic. 
Using water in a supercritical state allows us to create a reactor condition in which we can transform biomass or waste into three main components. A solid, which is a carbon-rich material, a biofuel, which provides a foundation of creating alternative petrochemical sources, as well as a liquid phase, which can be utilized as an adhesive. We've also mixed these biomass sources that we've extracted from hydrothermal processing with silk. Thereby, we can mimic what nature does, combining an existing material like silk, which, is amazing, which has amazing properties, with the kinds of materials that nature has created through waste using this hydrothermal process. By combining the processes created using hydrothermal processing with other biological materials like silk, we can create composite materials and take advantage of the best properties of both components and engineer new properties into this. We can develop, for instance, conductive and flexible biomaterials that can reach strength and cytocompatibility by using silk. We can also reach environmental friendly, less expensive processing conditions and packaging conditions for food, for instance, to enhance materials further by using graphene or carbon nanotubes. We can overcome the solubility issue of conventional graphene or carbon nanotube materials by using chitin or wood or activated carbon. In a recent research study, we've used shrimp waste to create chitin-rich materials that we've then processed in the hydrothermal processing plant to create materials that we've used to make electrodes for flow batteries. This could provide a solution to both the waste problem as well as providing new battery technologies that can be very powerful in storing alternative sources like solar or wind. We've also used waste from chemical treatment plants or sewage treatment plants, for example from the Deer Island facility near Boston, and used sewage sludge to process it using hydrothermal processing to create a biocrude mimicking oil as biobinders, as an adhesive for use in the adhesive construction industry, for instance. In all this work, we're paying close attention to the techno-economic analysis. In other words, how economically feasible these processes are. And it turns out they are feasible. If we can scale it up, we're actually able to utilize waste by using this nanotechnology, nanoengineering approach to transform the ingredients, to transform the waste into functional and usable materials. We can also use these products to create new types of adhesives for wood-based products. For example, for particle wood or plywood, where we need a glue or an adhesive to con construct materials that have strong binding between wood particles and the surrounding faces. Using biomass provides a way of utilizing waste, either from sewage plants or perhaps waste from wood facilities, for example sawdust, to combine these together with existing wood technologies to create new types of paneling that are formaldehyde free and work on a low energy sustainable economic cycle. Another exciting direction of this work is to utilize these biomass-based waste streams and transformations in the creation of 3D printing materials, or inks. Once we have transformed a biomass or waste into an ink material, we can construct any geometry, any architecture. We can begin to assemble materials atom by atom from the nano to the micro to the meso to the macro level, all from these waste materials. The function of materials derives from the hierarchical patterns across different scales. Nature has taught us how effective this paradigm is. The concept is now, can we learn from computational methods how to actually construct these materials? You can imagine if you're thinking about hierarchical patterning, the design space is gigantic, it's very big, and it's very difficult to find solutions for where to put materials, what to print, or what kind of materials to actually make in the first place. That's why we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to solve this problem. In machine learning, we have methods that can very accurately capture hierarchical patterns. Think about image recognition or face recognition. These algorithms, for example, Im implemented in convolutional neural networks, use deep layers within the neural network to detect features across length scales and time scales. These features are used to decide whether an image or a photo is a car, a tree, or a cat or dog. In our case, we're using these convolutional neural networks to determine what function the material has by looking at its microstructure across length scales, from the protein length scale, which is basically the code of DNA, the chemical composition, the microscale, the mesoscale, all the way to the macroscale shape and form of the material. Deep learning is a powerful way of capturing structure, process, function relationships that are otherwise very difficult to understand. There are many other machine learning methods that can be used in addition to convolutional neural networks, such as deep learning based methods based on game theory or GANs, generative adversarial neural networks, which basically implement a game theoretic approach where multiple neural networks, multiple AIs play games with each other to find solutions to physics problems. These solutions can not only be the solution to a physics problem like the equilibrium of forces, 
but they can also be the solution to a design problem where the algorithm will determine the optimal design given a set of constraints. This is extremely exciting because it enhances human creativity. In fact, we can complement or supplement human creativity by creating augmented reality or virtual reality environments where we can interact with the AI system with our senses. And we can make things seen that we cannot yet see, like forces in a material. By going into an augmented reality environment, we can see forces, for instance. We can see magnetic fields. We can see things that our own senses, our own eyes cannot yet recognize but the AI algorithm can make it visible to our senses. And we can then use this in the design process. In other words, we can see the immediate impact of how changing the process, the nanostructure, the mesoscale structure, the shape of a material affects certain properties. Properties we can usually not see, which are, however, very important for engineering applications, like the forces in the material are critical to prevent materials from breaking. Now we can see them using AI and algorithmics, algorithmic developments like virtual reality. That way we can push the frontier to the next level in which we understand how hierarchical structures can result in defect tolerant behavior. For instance, we can make materials from waste that are superior, that are superior in strength and resilience. In other words, they're very hard to break. Think about glass. Glass breaks very easily. However, we don't want to build with glass because we don't want to build a structure, a house, a car, a train, an airplane out of glass. It's very fragile. Using nature's design paradigm, we can transform brittle elements like minerals or glass particles into structures that are very tough as a whole by creating these architectural features from the nano to the macro scale. And AI methods can teach us how to assemble these patterns, these building blocks. This is very similar to the kinds of problems people have already solved using AI methods, like how to play chess or Go, which can be very effective and have proven to be a very powerful way of solving complex game theoretic approaches. Now we're using AI machine learning to solve similar problems, but instead of solving how to play Go, we can solve the problem, the puzzling problem of how to design the best possible material out of waste. That is an exciting future that allows us to mimic nature and yet train the problem, develop a problem solution that mimics it such that we provide solutions for our own problems, for our own challenges that we're facing today, such as creating high volume, tough, resilient materials, green materials, carbon sinks, or to create electrodes for batteries, or filtration devices, or robots, or materials that have actuation properties, that are smart, that can interact with the environment. These are all challenging problems of materials design that need a revolutionary approach, such as AI and machine learning. Now, to make these materials, we can use 3D printing. We talked earlier about 3D printing as a powerful way of assembling materials atom by atom, micro by micro, all the way to the macro level. In fact, we're using these multi-scale additive manufacturing techniques to then assemble these waste stream derived inks into materials that can then be created and applied in various industrial settings. We can make materials with tailored properties. We can dial in, we can decide exactly what kind of strength the material should have, what kind of elasticity, when it should break, what kind of tunability properties it should have, or how it would interact with the human body in cells or animals or other types of environmental systems. And all of these materials can be made with nature. They can be made out of polymers or chemicals that are actually found in nature. So think back about the material like silk. Silk is found in nature. Proteins are found in nature. All of us are living examples of how nature uses proteins to build life. Now we can create new material solutions, new technologies, new electronics, the future of computing perhaps, future computing architectures out of these silk-based or protein-based or amino acid-based materials, which are exciting solutions. Genetic algorithms allow us to provide a simulation of evolutionary processes. By combining it with AI and machine learning, which provides very quick, very rapid computational solutions to complex physics problems, to understand how design changes affect changes in the fitness or performance. By combining these AI methods with genetic algorithms, we can essentially simulate evolution. And within a couple of hours or days in a computer simulation, design optimal proteins. These are all solutions that can be made today and that we're working very hard at MIT in my lab to create future possibilities for future generations to thinking to work with nature instead of against nature and providing a platform to use waste as a way to create the future of materials. The experimental testing that can be carried out based on the materials we have created can be fed back right into the AI model and therefore create a reinforcement learning approach where the performance, 
measured in the laboratory can improve the model itself and thereby improve the design experience overall. Now, the human input, the human creative input, the input of the engineer comes in through these augmented reality or virtual reality setups where we can interact with the computational models in different ways. We can see things we cannot yet see, like internal forces, electricity, magnetic forces, uh, or other things, and we can augment the picture, the images that we can see with our eyes through these AI methods very effectively in the augmented reality or virtual reality setup. Through these methods, we're hoping to mimic nature. We're trying to work with nature instead of against nature. If we want to address the climate challenge, if we want to address the challenges that we are facing in future generations in terms of sustainability, creating more food, more resilience, more resources for a growing population in the world, we have to look at nature. And we have a great opportunity now with nanotechnology emerging as one of the most exciting trends in science and engineering and a platform technology combined with computational modeling like AI and machine learning, we can put these things together and create solutions for future generations that mimic nature and that build on nature and work with nature. The future of engineering lies in thinking about how natural materials are designed, how they're created, how they interact. The future of materials also features living materials, materials that aren't static. Today's engineers create materials that are made in the factory after they've been designed by an engineer and they're then shipped off to the consumer or applied in a product and they have a lifetime and they fail and have to be repaired. Now, that's a very different paradigm than the kind of paradigm that nature uses. Uh, think about our own body, our bones. They grow and if you hurt your bones, you hurt your skin, our body will try to repair these. And in many cases, our body is very effective in repairing injuries or diseases. And we are trying to get to the point where future materials, future technologies work just like this, where we can actually mimic the paradigm. Instead of creating materials one time and then repairing them, we're trying to mimic this paradigm, where instead of creating materials and shipping them off to the consumer until they fail, we built in a repair feature. We built in the ability of a material to be living, to be more like us. The material to be more like human beings, more like insects, more like the living world around us. And being able to sense damage, to respond to the environment, and to create entirely new solutions for engineering solutions in that way. Where, of course, the human need, the human demand for civilization is at the center of this. And we can work with sustainable solutions that are carbon sinks, that use waste materials, that use the immense complexity, the richness of all the chemical waste, all the chemical tailings we have today in the construction of materials. The key to making this happen are three. One, nanotechnology to use the ability to construct materials atom by atom, molecule by molecule. Second, computation. To use computation as a way of understanding what to build, what to design. And three, to be able to measure and sense the environment, either using augmented or virtual reality or advanced experimental imaging or measurements where data can be generated in large amounts, which in turn can improve the way we model using the artificial intelligence method, for instance, to use a reinforcement learning approach to improve models as we go along. Finally, this is changing the way engineers work. The way the physical world is modeled goes back today pretty much to Newton's laws, where we solve equations like differential equations that have been written down on a piece of paper. The future might rely on an alternative approach or complementary approach, where in addition to solving equations like Newton's laws, Schrodinger's equation, and others like this, we can also generate data and behavior and understand the behavior of physical systems directly from observations. So instead of having Newton observe how an apple falls from the tree and then deriving a model for this, computers can do similar things. Computers can observe how physical systems or living systems act, interact, behave, how they work. And then from that derive a deep learning or neural network based architecture. One of the biggest threats to climate change is the use of resources. And that's what this research really is about. The approach used by nature is quite distinct, where nature uses the same chemical ingredients. So instead of using limestone, like for cement or petroleum or other types of ingredients, nature uses the same chemical building blocks, amino acids, to create virtually any function. These protein-based materials have functions as diverse as acting as a glue, as a sensor, as a robot material, a robotic material that has act activation properties that can sense the environment. It can act as a signaling material like a cable for nerve cells, for instance. It can act as the very strong material like seen in silk, being one of the strongest materials known, stronger than steel. Um, and the list goes on. Uh, these materials are exciting. They're powerful. And yet they're made from the same chemical building blocks. 
So to address the climate challenge, we believe we need to go to that mode of operation. We want to be able to be in a position where we can actually create almost any function out of almost any feature.